Good evening and welcome to uh, this town hall meeting. Uh, my name is Matthew Bertarami. I'm the board representative. Uh, I am the Lake and Dam chairman. Uh, and tonight we have John Tucci from Lake Savers who's going to um, show you what we've done over the past year, and actually two years, of uh, how the lake has been improving and what our plans are for the future. If you have any questions, we ask that you wait till the end. And then there's a microphone up here. Come up to the microphone. You can ask questions either John or myself. And we'll be uh, do our best to give you good answers. Okay, so without further ado, John. Great. I think I can go uh, without microphone. I'm pretty good at that. Um, it's great. It actually is great to be here uh, this year. It's nice to be able to leave my bug brew fest at home. And it uh, feels real good for that. Um, and, um, you know, just as a, as a reminder, you know, our, our mission at Lake Savers is to make lakes and reservoirs healthier using natural sustainable technologies that work and we worked really hard this year to try and fulfill this mission for uh, Lake Heritage and I'd like to acknowledge and thank our team, my team, uh, that did a lot of the work down here. Fred Lishman and Corey Thorpe. Anybody, <laughs> anybody who don't know how to work hard I haven't met these two guys so I'm really grateful to have them. Uh, be carrying the load down here and help us uh, work together to uh, fulfill this mission and, and what it's all about is our belief is when you give a lake what it needs to be healthy the problems that drive us nuts as lake homeowners start to naturally disappear and the challenge for this lake is you know how quickly could we make that happen and so I thought a lot about how uh, how to tell the story tonight and I think simple is the best. So I think the best way to talk about uh, what's going on is to talk about where we've been, where we are, and where we're going. So our agenda will focus on taking us back a little bit so we, we reorient ourselves to what is the challenge that we're all facing uh, with Lake Heritage. And this is probably an important slide and framework to keep in mind as stakeholders in Lake Heritage. This is called the Lake Trophic Index and it's a, uh, a scale that is used by professional limnologists to gauge the overall health of a, of a lake from you know pristine which is what is called oligotrophic to you know pretty healthy, uh, productive with a good fishery but still not a lot of weeds and algae to experiencing some problems, to we're in a heap of trouble. And according to a certified lake professional in the state of Pennsylvania, this guy, Lake Heritage on the Trophic Index in 2015, I think this report was done, was at 68 to 71. And you can see the scale that they typically use stops at 65. So this is, this was and still remains a difficult lake improvement and lake maintenance challenge um, and that's important to uh, to keep in mind so to try you know so a little bit more about that um, what does that really mean in terms that we understand as lake homeowners well a hyper eutrophic lake like this one was out of oxygen below 10 feet so basically you had a dead zone in the lake below 10 feet uh, prior to, to aeration. Total phosphorus, which is the key nutrient that feeds that nasty algae that none of us like and can make us sick, uh, is 5 to 15 times target for a healthy lake ecosystem. And it bounces up and up and down during the season, but on average it's 5 to 15 times target. The sediment at the bottom of the lake, at least in the center of the lake, not on the edges, you've got nice, clean, hard bottom edges, which is really, in many areas, which is really good for a lot of the lake, but the sediment, uh, where it's not that nice, clean, hard bottom, average 70% organic, meaning it was 70% compost, muck, 
goop, stuff that can feed weeds and algae, and if you put it on your tomatoes, it almost is too fertile and would burn your tomatoes because there's so much nutrient in it. Uh, the main inlet total phosphorus levels are 15 to 25 times target for a healthy lake. So every time it rains, not all through the season, but particularly in the spring, uh, that water coming in is uh, 15 to 20 times higher than what you'd want to come into a healthy lake. And we all knew that the result of this was the algae blooms and the E. coli bacteria that really is not stuff you want in the lake. So in 2015, we implemented our program, the Lake Savers Natural Program, whole lake aeration. We filtered a couple of the worst inlets. We uh, used conventional biological treatment. We put some powders and potions into the lake in 2016. And we even tried some new innovations around chemistry. We tried to use some fairly inexpensive materials that were supposed to lock up phosphorus when we put it in the water and keep it away from the blue-green algae. And the result was what I like to call the big fail in 2016. The big fail. We, we never obviously want to see this again. Um, and we did put a lot of effort, and we're very grateful to the community for uh, coming to this meeting last year with very valid, uh, very important concerns, but giving us a shot to uh, hit it again in 2017. So our commitment, I believe this is a direct quote in, uh, from that meeting last September, is we will do whatever it takes to prevent this from happening in 2017. And so over the winter, working with Matt and his team and the board, we developed what we call the 2017 DEFCON plan for this lake. And it consisted of three specific treatment pathways. DEFCON 1 was what we call a new approach to biological treatment. From our perspective, it's the best, it would be the best um, alternative because it's the most healthy for the lake, and for you, it's also the cheapest, okay? So that's two good things in its favor. But we had no idea if it would work. So then we developed DEFCON 2, which, and, and we'll share these slides so you can read this detail if you want. DEFCON 2 was... Uh, the use of a peroxide-based preventative treatment that is uh, not, as, not as beneficial to the lake as biology, but less harmful to the lake than copper sulfate. And DEFCON 3 was copper sulfate. And you can see, you know, another thing you don't really, I, you know, you probably really don't like about these two DEFCON 2 and 3 is the price tag is significantly higher if we had to go that route than, uh, than pure biological treatment. So that was the game plan. Research and develop a completely new approach to biological treatment, way beyond these off-the-shelf potions and powders that we had tried the year before. We had it in our back pocket to use this peroxide-based treatment, and then in our other back pocket to call in the cavalry and use copper sulfate-based herbicides to not have a repeat of what we had last year. I think it's important also to, to recap why we are so hesitant to go back to copper sulfate on this lake. And so this is a research paper on uh, side effects from 58 years of copper sulfate treatment on the Fairmont Lakes in Minnesota, several lakes in the developed part of Minnesota. And, and you know, again, you can read this in more detail later, but basically accelerated, as a result of copper sulfate, you can expect accelerated phosphorus recycling from the lake bed and recovery of the algal population within 7 to 21 days. So you kill it, the phosphorus comes back up off the bottom, and it grows right again. Long-term effects of copper sulfate include copper accumulation in the sediments. Copper is toxic in that form to most 
life forms in a lake, so that's not a, a terribly desirable thing. Tolerance adjustments of certain species of algae to copper sulfate dosages. That means that the worst kind of algae, the blue-green algae, develop resistance over time. So, and on and on. The bottom line is copper sulfate is bad for people, it's bad for fish, it's toxic in the lake bed, and it's only good for blue-green algae in the long run. So it is a DEFCON 3. It's only if we have to is the way we look at it, and, and we prefer never. A little bit more about the downside of the copper sulfate. When you kill algae with it, it tends to release more of the toxic compounds into the water column, the cyanotoxins. And so even though you may not have as green a water, you can often have a lot more toxic compounds in it that you really don't want to be swimming in. So that's that's why we're so uh, we're so adamant about trying something different. So that kind of takes us to the present. What we actually did this year uh, was biological treatment with very minimal use of peroxide product early in the season. So we really were able to stay at DEFCON 1 and barely dip into DEFCON 2. No copper sulfate used at all. So any rumors around the lake that, oh, they must have hit it with copper sulfate, not true. What we actually did, though, is <clears throat> the lake, if we all remember, the lake was blooming very early this year. It started turning green in April. And by May 1st, it was bad. And we started treating the last week of April. And we we're just getting started with this biological treatment, figuring out how to do it efficiently. We put a treatment in. We thought we saw some minor results. We came back, hit it again within a week. Thought we saw a little bit more results. But by May 10th or so, the lake didn't look a whole lot better. And uh, I remember talking to Matt, and Matt said, it doesn't look like it's working. I think we need to go to copper sulfate. And so we scheduled the copper sulfate, the other treatment company that would come in with copper sulfate for the Thursday before Memorial Day. And I said to Matt, if you guys will let us do it, we'd like to hit the lake at least two more times before Memorial Day to see if we could knock this thing out. And so we did that. And the Monday before, the Monday before Memorial Day weekend, or maybe <coughs> Tuesday, we were able to call the other company and say, you don't need to come out this Thursday. Um, we also added three additional diffusers to the deep end of the lake. Uh, we'll talk about uh, some interesting results as a result of that. The cove cleanout by the by this community, the effort that was put in by your team, was absolutely, I think, uh, a huge help to the lake getting all of that junk out of as many coves as you could get to, and I, I know that they're planning on continuing that this year, uh, absolutely fantastic strategy to help keep this lake clean. The reinstallation and improvement of the inlet barriers, combined effort by our guys and by the, the maintenance crew that you have, we work together, they got blown out in the spring with some heavy rain, we had to come back, get them back in place, figure out how to reinforce them. So that was a great team effort. And then the installation of the plants, the, the hyacinth plants, the floating islands and the and the, the one, at least one cove where you sectioned off the whole cove and had all those plants growing was a really great experiment. One of the findings um, that many of the folks that have studied this lake, I think including the group from the university this year, was that you don't have enough plants taking up nutrients in this lake, so the only thing left to use it is algae. So by, by putting those hyacinths in, it was really a fast way to get more vegetation into the lake that doesn't bother boating or doesn't hurt anybody, helps clean the water, and then the best thing about it is that they then made the effort to pull all of those plants out of the lake so that all of the phosphorus and all the nitrogen that they used up out of the lake this year is now going to get dumped somewhere else. So you've actually removed some nutrient from the lake. So great team effort. Um, and 
you know, fortunately, we, we only had to go pretty much to DEF CON, DEF CON 1. Um, and for us, the real uh, game changer was uh, this bioblast treatment. So where we failed last year with the chemistry approach, we tried to be innovative with chemistry to fix the lake. We kind of had a realization over the winter that we've got a biological problem. There are trillions upon trillions upon trillions of blue-green algae cells that want to grow in this lake. The only way we can logically fight that is to find some other biological organism that can take them on one-on-one. -on -one. And it turns out the only way to do that cost-effectively is not to dump a bunch of potions and powders in the lake, but to actually get into the brewing business. So instead of being a microbrew for beer, we're a microbrewery this year for beneficial bacteria. Very microscopic. Some of these organisms you can only see with an electron microscope. But in each one of our tanks, there are trillions upon trillions of these, uh, these beneficial organisms that we wake up in these tanks and then get into the lake. Uh, as quickly as we can and as at high volume as we can. They're all natural beneficial bacteria strains. They're very common soil and water organisms, so there's nothing weird in them that you don't see out in the environment. We're just concentrating them. They're native to North America and they're certified organic and non GMO. So this is not, you know, science fiction. Uh, creating new bugs that are going to now turn and attack us. This is pretty safe, pretty proven uh, technology that is used in agriculture, used in wastewater. We have just amped it up to a new level. And in fact, uh, I calculated it all out. We did 10 treatments of the lake between 426 and this week for, and put a total of 200,000 gallons of activated product in this lake in order to try to combat this. And you spend a lot of money for that. I, I, you know, I'm not going to go deep into budgets. You can talk to your board. But what I will say is I did the calculation. You pay about 17 cents a gallon for that product. And if you can find a cheaper way to do what we did, uh, this year with this product, let me know because I'll, I'll, I'll start doing that. And uh, I think most of you might have seen that's a 250 gallon tank that we have on the boat. We had another one on a truck that we're able to get into the coves. So you can do the math, divide two, 200,000 by 250. That's how many trips we made to try and get this product where it needed to be in the lake uh, during the course of the summer. Uh, this was uh, this was the coolest thing on the floor. Yeah, you know, I love the little ones; those were great. But this is really innovative. You basically took a dead end coal, your team put a simple, inexpensive boom in, and how many plants did you start in this when you first started it, Matt? Twenty. Twenty turned into this water hyacinth. It grows great, and. Uh, yeah, and now all of that's been harvested. 99.9% of that's been harvested out and is uh, taking that nutrient right out of the lake. So really great, you know, the, the, these technologies are not easy. It's not easy, uh, it's not easy fixing a lake that's in this condition and, and doing it naturally. Um, but, you know, together with the innovation you guys are doing, because uh, I will tell you, this is a fact. You can measure the square footage of that. There is a, several companies that sell floating treatment wetlands or floating islands that you can plant with plants. Planted and installed, those are $80 to $100 a square foot. So if you want to do the math, you measure this by this. And you can do the math of how much that area is that one area with one of these manufactured floating islands probably would have cost you $100,000. That's a guess, but that's the, you know, you can do the map at $80 to $100. Under $200. What's that? This cost was under $200. Under $200. Right. 
do all of them. To do all of them. So that's innovation right there. That's that's what it takes to, you know, it kind of takes a village, it takes a community. Uh, that's what it takes to, to, to turn a lake like this around, is that kind of thinking and innovation. So now it's time to talk about results. I think we can all agree that 2017 was an improvement, but what does the data say? We've got a lot of it. So uh, we're going to cover what the data says about algae, about water chemistry, and about, what, and about sediment chemistry. For those of you that are not into data and would rather uh, surf on Facebook or whatever for the next uh, few minutes, I can sum it up in, uh, in uh, two simple uh, graphics. 2016, that's what the data said. 2017, that's what the data said. So well, let's, let's dig into the real differences. This is a picture of what we call an algae <coughs> community assessment. The green color is blue-green algae. It's the algae you don't want in your lake in any quantity. It's natural to have five to, you know, one to ten percent uh, of the total population be blue-green algae even in a healthy lake, but you can see, you know, oh great, in the spring we were all happy. We had good water clarity, no blue-green algae. We thought, you know, oh, the aeration is going to work great, but pretty soon it got warm and a lot of other things happened, and blue-green algae was over 95 percent of the total population of the algae in the water in this lake through virtually all of 2016. Then we get into 2017 uh, right here, and you can see it's starting to bloom that as early as eight, March and April, it's starting to get bad, 25-30%. And uh, this is right around the time we started our bioblast treatment. Uh, we were a little late. I mean, it caught us by surprise that it bloomed that early. So we were, I guess, just in time. And you can see we treated probably three times between here and here. And you can see how, the, how within a couple weeks after, after that, that, it really started to flip. And now we were in through the summer where we really had very little blue-green algae in June and July started to creep up a little bit toward the end of August and the end of September, but there's a second part, well, first the, the takeaway from this, bad algae dominated in 16, good algae for the most part dominated in 17 once the bioblast treatment took hold. Um, and then this is specifically the blue-green algae pattern of growth through 16 and 17. So I've isolated blue-green algae. 90 plus, 95 plus percent through all of the summer of 16. It naturally dies off in the winter, started climbing up again early in, in 17. We hit it with a bioblast. It took about a month for that to kick in, and then we dropped it right off the table until it creeped up just a little bit in, in the end of 17. Well, we were kind of backing off the treatment also to kind of save a little bit of budget as well. So the takeaway here is blue-green algae was reduced to virtually zero risk or concern Memorial Day through Labor Day. However, we did learn that, you know, because we've had some fall issues, we did learn that as it creeps back up again, up past 10%, we really need to be vigilant because that's when we were starting to see some collection in the coves again this fall. Now, another piece of good news related to that is a measure of not just percent, but the total algal cells in a sample that we take. It's cells per middle, milliliter on a slide. And you can see when the lake blooms like crazy with blue-green algae, you've got 600 plus, 500 plus, 400 plus cells per milliliter. Cells per milliliter. A milliliter is a very small amount of water. Um, but you can see as we got into 17 and the bioblast kicked in, we maintained significantly lower cell counts of all types of algae in the water for all of 17. So even though we had some creeping 
of the blue-green algae in some of these, it's still on a pure number of cells in the lake basis was way less than anything we experienced in 2016. Uh, and again, that's where we kind of started the, uh, the bioblast. Uh, the lake was much cleaner in terms of total amount of algae in the water column in 17. You know, the cell counts in 17 reflect a pretty healthy balanced level of growth in the lake. Now, I'd love to keep, next year, I'd like to have them all be under 100 or, or uh, you know, under, under 60 even. That would be even better. But big improvement, almost a tenfold improvement um, on some of these versus 2016. Uh, the microcystin testing. This is not testing that we do. This is testing the other company does. Um, this is the stuff that can make you sick in the lake if the blue green gets bad enough. So in 2016, the target in Ohio, you know, the, the target of warning, and, and, and really you got to take notice because uh, Pennsylvania doesn't have one, and neither does Michigan, but Ohio does, is, uh, is 20 micrograms per liter. So you can see we were, we were, Oh, we were okay in the center of the lake for uh, part of the summer, but way over in the near shore areas where it was really green and nasty. And then later in the year, it got incredibly bad. I mean, this is nightmare scenario here. Center of the lake, over 25, and then near shore, this was over 6,000. That's bad. That's that's epic fail 2016. That's what that is. 2017, there were two testing dates. There are two tests conducted. I think a third were waiting for the results. Look at the difference. And what does that really mean? Well, the takeaway here is levels were lower than what is allowable for drinking water, for drinking water for adults and school-aged children in 2017. So this is virtually zero. In some cities that get their water from reservoirs instead of wells, they're sending water with more microcystin in out to your taps. So that's, that's big improvement. That's significant. So while we still dealt with some scummy stuff here and there in some places, it was a sea change in, in terms of the risk to dogs and kids and us um, using the water. Uh, and we, you know, we were looking to improve on this and on the, you know, the aesthetics even more next year. Um, so now in the sediment chemistry, we track the water clarity using uh, this tried and true secchi disk me measurement. You know, we all got cocky and fooled in uh, June 1 of 2016, we had 10 feet of clarity. And we thought, oh, it must be the aeration. Oh, it must have been the winter bacteria we put in. And then the lake taught us a lesson, as we know, both with algae and water clarity. What we think actually happened is we had a good snow melt year, and the lake filled up with good, clean water from snow melt in 2016, but the nutrients were high, and as soon as it got warm enough, the blue-green algae took off, and you know, we were done. In 2017, the water coming into the lake wasn't really great. We didn't have a lot of snow, and the early water was a lot of runoff from the barren farm fields with the spring rains. I think they brought in a lot of nutrient, and so the algae actually started to take off earlier, uh, but we got on top of it. And while we didn't have what I would call great water clarity, it did start to improve significantly as we got into the fall. And the takeaway though here is there was a lot less bad stuff in the water that could affect water clarity, but there's still a lot. Of, there was still a lot of stuff in the water, so it wasn't going to hurt you. Uh, it wasn't real icky, it didn't make you real feel, feel real slimy, 
but because there's still so much nutrient in the lake, something is going to grow there. At least this year we had stuff growing in the water that was healthier for us and healthier for the lake. But our, our goal is to bring the nutrient levels down enough in future years to keep the lake above what I call, what I consider kind of a minimum clarity target of five feet. I'd really like to see six plus feet of clarity. That, that would be like a really neat goal to get to on this lake as quickly as, as we can. Um, total phosphorus. Uh, big changes. I mean, you can see, I don't know what, here's what I can say about this. I think we have to, I think we have to take some credit for this trend here. The levels are, were so high prior to this year and so bouncy that this seems to be an unusual pattern. We obviously had a spike here in August, probably related to some heavy rain. We want to track this over probably another couple of years and see if we can continue this kind of overall downward trend and eliminate these real big spikes. So we think this is going in the right direction, but it's a little too early to tell. For sure, this is when we started the bioblast treatment. It's improving, we think, but this is still the major issue that needs to be addressed moving forward. You can see this is the target for a healthy lake. And we kind of got close at one data point, July 3rd. Don't know why, really. Uh, and then we bounced back up, and we're still pretty far away. This is too big of a delta on average from what's healthy for a lake for total phosphorus and we need to close that gap. This is what's called soluble re reactive phosphorus. That's the phosphorus that the algae can use right away to fuel its growth. A little better story here in terms of the, you know, the prior pattern of some really huge spikes and some really incredibly high levels. This is really you can, you can have wastewater lagoons that have this amount or even a little less orthophosphate in it than what these levels up here are. And we think that's a function of when the blue-green algae blooms and busts, as those cells die, they release a ton of phosphorus into the water, and then that fuels the next bloom, and then it kind of comes down a little bit, and then a lot of it dies, and it fuels the next bloom. And what we think is that by, again, working the bioblast treatment, we think that this pattern is significant in that we're starting to see a much more, uh, less or much less volatile bouncing of the orthophosphate. And we're, we're seeing a pretty strong trend line over time of getting it closer to this ideal level of, um, of this is, 10 parts per billion, and we hit around here, we hit levels just over three, just, uh, just over 30 parts per billion. So you can see the difference. This is 30 parts per billion. This is 160 parts per billion. Big difference. Actually, it might be more than that. It's like 1,600 parts per billion. Um, so this is, we think this is the key to why we had a, such a great result for most of 2017 is that we got very consistent reduction in this bioavailable or soluble reactive phosphorus. And we want to push this even harder uh, next year. We think the way to do that is to start treating the lake earlier so that we can avoid this kind of spiking in the early spring when the, when, the, when the lake wants to start to get into that bloom cycle. So here's dissolved oxygen. You can see in 2016, the aeration system was not able to keep dissolved oxygen above the target of two milligrams per liter in the 40 foot depth of the lake. This was still a pretty big improvement in dissolved oxygen over prior years with no aeration system but this was identified as a problem, something that we needed to fix. You can see in 2017, we had just one point where we were getting close to the lower limit 
uh, but recovered fairly quickly um, and stayed above, pretty consistently above the lower limit uh, for, the, for the whole season. And we'll have numbers from uh, today too, but as the water gets colder, this will most definitely go up um, in the last uh, measurement of the season. The takeaway, dissolved oxygen is much better in 17. The additional diffusers were key, but we think that the reduction in blue-green algae was even more important. And we'll, we'll talk about why on the next slide. So this is the temperature uh, of the water at the surface, which is blue, the middle of the water column, which is 20 feet down in the 40-foot zone, and 40 feet down uh, at the bottom in the deep part of the lake. And what this tells us, what our aeration system is supposed to do is mix the lake well enough and rapidly enough that it pretty much equalizes temperature top to bottom, uh, even in the 40-foot depth. And you can see in 2016, until we hit the fall when the water gets colder and, uh, you know, uh, oh, actually, it wasn't even that. We added the diffusers. We added the new diffusers. We had a pretty big delta in 2016 in temperature from top to bottom. Um, now, uh, I, no offense to any engineers in the room, but you got to realize that this system was, was engineered by a professional engineer doing all the calculations that engineers do and to size these systems. And actually, they sized the system originally for 18 diffusers. I'm a pretty conservative guy. I won't tell you what they called me in high school. It's, you can't tell you that. Um, but I'm a pretty safe guy. I'm a pretty conservative guy. So I took that 18 diffuser design and we upped it to 23 when we implemented the system. So that's probably a 25% safety rate relative to the engineer design by the professional engineer. And we still have this delta. So it tells me that real world conditions are a little different than what the desk jockeys see when they do these calculations. So fortunately, we had sized the system so that it could be expandable again. And we added the three diffusers in the very deep part of the lake, upping up to 27. And look at the difference through the summer. Very small delta in temperature all through this whole year um, as a result of the addition of those diffusers. So what that says is that the, the, the system is doing a much better job of circulating the water fast enough to pull oxygenated water down to the bottom and keep that moving continuously. If you then start to run out of oxygen at the bottom despite that, doesn't necessarily mean your aeration system is bad. It's doing the job it's supposed to do. It's just that you have so much demand at the bottom of the lake that it's using up the oxygen faster than we can get it down there. And even adding, uh, adding a couple of diffusers more may not even help that situation because uh, at a given temperature when the water gets warmer in the summer, uh, the water holds less oxygen, so even if we mixed it faster, we probably wouldn't uh, uh, you know, uh, change that DO characteristic very much with additional diffusers now that we've got it dialed in here. So our, um, our answer is that with the addition of these three diffusers, the system is pretty well optimized. Further improvements in DO will come from reducing the amount of biology in the lake. Um, and the only way to do that is to reduce the nutrients. So that's kind of pulling our story together about where we're going to start to go. Um, one more slide that's important is the sediment chemistry, the muck on the bottom. We take seven, six measurements up through the spine of the lake where the, muck, the depth and the amount of the muck is uh, is the deepest and it's the most mucky um, from the dam all the way up to within 100, 200 feet of the, of the viaduct there, of the bridge. Um, and when, before we started in 2015, the average organic content of that muck across those samples was 70% compost and 30% mineral. 
sand or silt, you know, crushed rock. While we failed on a lot of things in 2016, one of the things we didn't fail at was starting to reduce that muck on the bottom. And so you can see we had some dramatic improvements in reducing the amount of compost in the bottom in 2016. We kind of spiked up a little bit here, probably from inputs of new stuff with the spring runoff season off the farm fields. Kind of got it back under control. The key point here is the healthiest lakes in the world, I'm talking, you know, lakes that you can see 50 feet down in, their level of organic in the sediment is 10% or less. And we're hovering just around 20% on average now um, as a result of aeration. Now, it's because of where your muck is, it's very difficult to measure the thickness change over time. But we can correlate this with a lot of other lakes that we work on where we have done actual depth measurements of the sediment. And our conservative estimate is that you've taken at least a foot of muck out of the 75 acre zone of the lake that's very mucky in the center of the lake which equates to 75 acre feet of muck, which equates to about 120 cubic yards of muck, which if you had to dredge that out, it would have cost you more than $2 million to do that. So the aeration system by the chemistry, you know, this is still an estimate, so, you know, I mean, don't take this one to the bank, but we know as a result of this change, if we started out with a pile of muck on the bottom that was 70% organic on average, and we've got it down to 20%, the only way that happens is that we've reduced that organic layer, and we're getting more and more concentration of sand and silt That's just in the, the bottom. Bubbling? It is bio, it, they call it biological dredging. So by getting oxygen to that compost pile, it's like a compost pile in your backyard. You start out with a huge pile of leaves, and if you aerate it and turn it a few times uh, once a week, the, the bacteria and the little critters that can eat those leaves, same thing, that's the same stuff that's on the bottom of the lake. And the bacteria that we're putting in at the surface, some of it works in the water column, some of it goes down to the bottom and eats the compost at the bottom of the lake. But it needs oxygen to do that. So that's where the aeration and the bugs work together. So um, you can get back off of Facebook and you know see the conclusions. Um, fighting with biology with biology works. I don't think there's any doubt. I mean, Mother Nature can throw us curveballs. They she threw us one this fall when we uh, which required us to come in and treat again because we didn't want to end the season on a down note and have the lake uh, you know, go to sleep with a big blue green algae bloom on it. So we whacked it again this week. But the data is pretty incontrovertible that this bioblast technology worked to break the cycle of blue green algae for this year. The code cleanup strategy is high payoff and should be continued. The floating islands, great innovation, should be expanded and continued. Um, and then, the observations indicate that the inlet filtration work that we've done are reducing the amount of sediment and nutrient reaching the lake. Matt uh, made, uh, had, had an observation that when they tried to go, when they put the floating islands in behind our barriers in Plum Run, the bottom was pretty firm and you could walk out there and put them in. And when they went to take them out, they were pretty deep in really soft, goopy stuff. So it's kind of hard to measure by the numbers how well they're doing, but they're clearly doing something. And we think that as budget allows, we need to continue. And, and I think the committee has already continued to do some additional filtration work upstream from the lake. And that is a, a key strategy to continue as well. So, and the future is very short, so don't don't worry, uh, the future is very short. So where to from here? You may be thinking, and, and I'm kind of thinking because uh, you know our guys are busy up in our other part of Pennsylvania for a lot of the summer, so I got the short straw, and 
a lot of that 200,000 gallons of product was put into the lake by yours truly this summer. So you're probably thinking 2017 was great, but how do we get off of this expensive train? You know, we don't want to be putting 200,000 gallons of biology into the lake every year for the rest of our lives. I certainly don't, and I know you probably don't want to pay for it. Um, I don't think it's going to be easy, but, but this is our project over the winter. The key point here, the next frontier is phosphorus. We got to keep driving phosphorus down in this lake any way, shape, or form. Rapid and significant reductions in water column phosphorus is pretty much the only way we're going to really break the cycle and, and get to the point where we don't have to put hundreds of thousands of gallons of, of biology into the lake to, to repeat this result next year. You're doing some things already in lake filtration. The floating islands are helping. We're, uh, oh, the second part is, no matter what though, I still think given the, given the characteristics of this lake and its watershed, you're probably always gonna need some amount, uh, you're probably always gonna need aeration to keep this lake healthy. But if we can do these two things, I think we can, we can get a much healthier lake um, and do it at a lower cost over time. One of the things we're doing is these are, uh, this is a PhD from the University of Minnesota. This is his PhD student. Um, this was a picture on their visit to my lake in Michigan. We are partnering with the Abbas uh, Research Lab who has developed a phosphorus sponge technology that we think has a lot of promise of enabling us to literally go, it's a sponge, literally go to the lake and deploy this material into the lake and pull out enough phosphorus quickly enough to get an accelerated reduction in phosphorus. And we have been selected, we, well, we haven't inked the ingredient totally, but we believe that we will be selected to commercialize this technology for lakes. Um, and if there's one thing that I know about the lake market is if this technology is greater than sliced bread but no one can afford it, who cares? So my role in commercialization will be to make sure that what they're telling me about the potential economics of this technology doesn't get messed up by somebody who thinks that lake homeowners have uh, you know, unlimited pockets to dip into to pay for this kind of thing. So that's where we're trying to go. In the meantime, we need to keep pushing on the inlet filtration and the floating islands to help uh, move that phosphorus curve down uh, for the lake and get us off the, you know, get us off the, you know, kind of the very aggressive biology treatment. So that's, that's the, uh, Long story. It wasn't a short story. That's the long story. So I'm happy to entertain any questions. How about the uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the climate? Was, was this year similar to last year? Was the amount of heat going into the lake? We, I, this year was better. Um, but we don't think it was, I don't think we can ascribe the improvement to the climate too much because you can see water temps were still pretty close to what they were in 16. So I think we, I think Mother Nature did us some favors and did us some unfavors. The unfavor was the spring runoffs, but the cooler summer helped and we got a little bit more rain this summer, which also I think helped, you know, because one theory I've been thinking about is in the spring when there's no crops on the field and you get a rain, you get bad water in the water. Um, in the summer when the crops are up and they're holding soil and it rains, you get better water into the lake. So summer rain is better than spring rain. And I think one of the things we got this year is more summer rain, which I think helped plus Only time will tell. Yeah, we live on uh, 96 Mead on the west side of the lake, 
And uh, the algae was pretty good all summer, but the last couple of weeks it really was bad. Yeah. But the question I have is, um, last winter we were taking some debris and an old tire out of the lake, and I almost got planted myself in the lake. I dumped my six, eight inches of muck. I couldn't get out. I didn't. I didn't get somebody dragged me out. But the, are they going to plan to aerate or or uh, dredge the coves on the west side of the lake? I mean, I know you did the east side last year. We, we're going to try to get to the coves that we can actually get into, but some coves are we're not able to get into because of all pro, uh, private property all around, and there's no access to it. So if, if we can get access to a cove and the weather permits, uh, we will try to get as many coves cleaned out as Ooh. possible, starting I mean, with the ones we didn't do last year, and then if we have time, we're in the code right there. between Mead and Long Street, okay. and and uh, that is on our list to do. <laughs> thank you, because I don't want to get stuck again. Yeah. I get plant, I get planted in the lake. I might, you know, grow some, <laughs> make some hair anyway. Take your rake, take your rake, your iron rake, and that's mm -hmm. how you do it. You tried that. <laughs> I, I still got stuck. Yeah, but anyway, I, I, but aerating the coves too, would that be helpful as well? Well, yeah, that's what, I mean, I, I certainly would like to sell you more aeration equipment or lease it to you, but one of the things we want to observe this year, the, de the dissolved oxygen in the coves stayed pretty good based on our observations and some of the measurements. So we hit the coves very hard with the biology. So we're hoping that we see some muck reduction in those coves because you have enough oxygen in the water already without aeration. Um, and the biology is really what does, does the work. We experimented with a form of cove aeration in 2016 and it basically was a gift to the power company. I mean, there are other things we can do, but um, you know, why we didn't go further with that this year is we had to fix this, we had to try to fix the systemic problem first. And if we can sustain that fix, then we can, I think, and if we can lessen the amount of money spent on biology, then I think we can invest in some of these other problem areas and make them better over time without blowing out the budgets. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, it just seems to me, I don't know much, but it seems like that and this team deserve a real thank you for my I mean, the hard labor came from somebody putting all those plants in my basement. So, 100%. Thank you, too. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I have to also mention, we ate, we ate more cookies than Cookie Monster this summer. <laughs> thanks to Isla, so that, that kept us going. Believe me, on the 12, 14-hour days, that kept us going. Because I don't even give my guys lunch, so they, most of the time, so they were eating cookies for lunch uh, quite a lot. So, um, what, what in your opinion, what was it that kind of started setting the lake off? Because we've lived here for about 10 years, and I think like 2015, 2016 was like the first time that it really showed this whole thing with the algae was a problem. Like, what was it that caused it? In, uh, basically, at the end of, I guess it was 2014, we had been researching ways to bring the lake back to health. It was a very unhealthy lake at that point. Uh, the fish were having a lot of problems. Uh, the lake wasn't doing well. And we were treating it with copper sulfate very often. And that was keeping the lake from looking real bad. But it wasn't healthy at that point. So we looked at ways. And then in uh, 2015, we went to bio biological treatment or without aeration. And that did not work very well. Uh, so then in 2016, we started with the aeration and the biological treatment. Uh, and as I said, 16 was a, a very bad year. And this year, last year, 2017 was, you know, was a good year. We turned things around. So what happened was we decided the lake was basically dying. And, and if we didn't do something, it would continue to die. If we kept throwing copper sulfate in, it, was, it would never get any better. Uh, so we changed over to more healthy treatment. And, and so we had a couple of bad years there. 
but hopefully we're past that now we're going to have continue to have good years. I know that the fishery out there is, is just is really really booming. There's all kinds of fish there. They're very healthy when you pull them out. They're chubby and they're and they're very active and nice color and everything. So the fish are doing so much better. And uh, I think in the long run, this is the way we can save the lake. But I think if we if we just kept going with copper sulfate, uh, you know, the lake would look good for a while longer, but it just it would get worse and worse and eventually you know, it, it really it would, we'd be you know totally lost. So would the copper sulfate have caused the problem in the first place, or was it? No, it, it's the high levels of phosphorus. The copper sulfate just kept it from blooming all the time. Okay, and so, uh, you know, for years, for 50 years, we've been having uh, nitrogen and phosphorus coming into this lake from farm fields, from from lawns, and from everywhere else. And so it built up to the point where, at the beginning, we said the levels were so high; they were, they were higher than we're on the scale. And copper sulfate was making it look okay, and we, you know, we get through with that, but it, it wasn't doing anything to change the underlying, underlying okay. cause, and and that's we switched over to change the underlying cause, and for a couple of years it didn't go through, and now it's going. Yeah, and there's a, yeah, there's, quite frankly, there's a learning curve. I mean, every lake's a little bit different, so we we. We had, yeah, 2016 for us was a year to really figure out what worked and what didn't, and then how, you know, how, you know, what do we have to do in 2017 to try and fix it? So we sometimes call that the healing crisis. Um, we're going to try to get better and better at not having those gap years, but, um, but it, it caught us by. I was shocked at how bad. I mean, it was it was unbelievably bad. I'd never seen a, a lake respond like that in 16. So, I think in a perverse way, it it absolutely was a wake up call for us to say we have to we have to come up with totally new strategies to have a chance at this. And so, at least in that, was a blessing in disguise. But, you had mentioned uh, earlier in the slides you showed that the uh, all the recommended guidelines for lakes uh, as far as inlet phosphorus and that kind of thing was 50 to 20 times you know above for our for our lake. Do we have um, data that shows that the particular inlets to the lake what the inlet uh, values were for concentrations for phosphorus or going up? Or was it kind of just summarized or, or um... we we have some data from I think 15 and we took some data we took some samples in the, the inlets in, in 2000 in the fall of 2015 and some in 16 because if we're going to kind of you it, it seems to me that if, based on that kind of dramatic numbers if we don't go back in our watershed and do some things in the watershed, watershed management to control phosphorus coming in, we're, we're still going to have problems. You get rainier years and rainier years, right. uh, we're, we're still going to have yeah. boatloads of phosphorus. The, the, the challenge with that is that that's always, you got to do it, but you got to realize it's a long term play mm -hmm. because getting people who own land right. away from the lake, they don't care. Yeah, it has to be maybe more aggressive watershed management. Uh, yeah, kind of you gotta remember we control the lake, but we don't control outside the lake. There is a, a you know conservation district, right. and they work with the mm -hmm. farmers and and try to do all kinds of things to control runoff from farms. So we don't really have any control about that. We aren't doing some things like uh, trying to have like set pools so that will drop sediment. Uh, we put the filters in. Okay, we're, we're working now on a, a proposal from the DCNR to actually reforest some of the, the community properties around here. And by reforesting those, uh, they, that will help to stop the nutrient flow coming into the lake. So we're doing a lot of stuff to do that, which hadn't been done for 50 years before this. Right. Uh, but you got to realize that. That's a slow process. You don't just stop it right away. And there's also 50 plus years of phosphorus and stuff in the lake, which we have to remove. And that's one reason why uh, we we use we did the water hyacinth 
experiment. And next year we intend to ex expand on that somewhat. Get, get more in and, and uh, get, uh, get plants in, in the runs going into lake. You might have seen this year that in a lot of the areas that had a little run going into the lake, community areas, we let the grass grow up. It's helped filter and stop sediment flow. Uh, so now this time of year, that will be cut down and that stuff will be taken out to get rid of the phosphorus in, in there. So next year, we're going to expand on that and try to get some uh, well, different type of vegetation and age vegetation in there uh, to do the same thing. But uh, we're going to let some of that stuff grow up. And it may not look pristine, but it's, I mean, it's, if we're going to have a healthy lake, it's the thing we have to do. I, I got to do one exercise. Everyone close their eyes because, you know, we're going to be anonymous here. <laughs> Honest. Close your eyes, raise your hand if you still put fertilizer on your lawn. Not bad. It's not bad. Don't. <laughs> don't. Just don't. I mean, you know, find other ways to make your grass look good with natural, you know, natural compost or stuff that'll stay put. And most of the soils around here don't need phosphorus or nitrogen. They might need some other kind of micronutrient, iron or something potassium or something like that, but um, they don't need phosphorus and nitrogen. Do you guys allow, uh, can you pull water from the lake to irrigate or not? You're not allowed to do that, okay. Um, that can be good and bad, but you really don't need to put commercial fertilizer on your lawn. In the newsletter, there was um, a suggestion about growing stuff in, in the swales. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I was thinking about that um, my wife doesn't think that would look very good. <laughs> you know, the swale runs around the whole property. Right. What could we put in there that might look okay? Well, we could put wildflowers in there. Uh, that native wild, wildflowers might look better. You could put uh, shrubbery in there. Uh, yeah, things, you know, things like that, and flowers and things like that. The thing is, what you want to do is when they're in there, when they're growing fine, but once they stop growing, you need to get them out and not let them die, uh, you know, die in there. And then the phosphorus gets washed into the into the lake. Uh, just letting that gr the grass grow. You don't have to let it grow real high. Just letting it grow up to five, seven, or eight inches will help filter the flow. So it it doesn't have to get to the point where it's uh, you know it's not looking good. It just <laughs> just instead of being you know, cut to two inches, which a lot of people cut their lawn. You should always leave your lawn deeper anyway. Let it grow to seven or eight inches in those swales. And uh, you know, that, that would do it. And, uh, you can keep it trimmed at a little bit higher level. That would help. Speaking of trees, um, Adam McLean from the Conservation District came and he showed us an aerial view of Deep Creek Lake. And he showed us how you couldn't see anything at all because it's totally surrounded by trees and the lake is pristine. And if you go out to the reservoir, it changes the forever, it's the same thing. Um, but in the fall, nobody rakes leaves out there. And all those leaves fall into Deep Creek Lake or fall into the reservoir. And it, it's not a problem for those lakes. Right. Will we get to that point where our leaves can fall in and we don't have to take them out of the lake? Or is there, can you, I also have read that there are good microorganisms in the leaves that are good food for the fish. Yes. So, so when, when we're trying to clean out the coves, I'm feeling I take some stuff out of the coves, but I'm, I'm kind of, I don't understand fully the good and the bad. Yeah, it's probably a bit of a trade off. Um, my lake in Michigan has been more forested than it is now, but it's 13,000 years old. And for 12,950 years, it had a sand bottom across 80 plus percent of the lake. And every year, tons of leaves would fall into that lake. But because it wasn't getting phosphorus from anywhere else, the lake was in balance in its surroundings. And every year, the leaves would go in. There was enough oxygen at the bottom. The microorganisms would break them down. They would start to feed the fish. And by the next year, that all that stuff was gone. The problem with a lake like ours, mine now, and yours is that there's so much unnatural stuff coming in 
that is almost impossible to stop because it's coming from farms that are several miles away and when it rains it comes in as a as a raging river that you just can't stop so it's kind of a trade-off in that would i rather have the leaves fall into the lakes and the manure from the farm fields running in yeah but we can do more about the leaves than we can do about the farm field runoff so that's kind of where we're at for now until we can implement a longer term strategy probably at the state or the national level to start changing some of the land use practices above these lakes. Thanks. Uh, two parts. So relative to the uh, planting of the soil along the property lines, will there be anything coming out from the board or the Lake Dam Committee with official recommendations of these are permitted, these are not permitted? Uh, in an article uh, a couple of months ago, I did list the plants that are that were recommended. Uh, basically, if it's a native plant to Pennsylvania, generally it's recommended. If it's non-native, then you should be shouldn't be being put in. So we go by that that scope standing position. That's yeah, that's okay. that's what I was saying. And part two, last year I think you talked about uh, this being a, a seven-year journey. Are we still on a seven-year path? At least, yeah. yeah. But what we committed to was that we couldn't have five years of an unusable lake and then it looks good in year six. So, <laughs> so you know, I, uh, I wouldn't be long for this business. So I actually think we made a quantum leap this year. What's, so according to the experts, um, they do say that there is a cumulative impact of this biological approach. So over a few years of treating the lake pretty heavily with this stuff, it should, it's not as good as a preventative watershed strategy, but it shouldn't just start every year as bad as we were the last year. So that's, uh, that's what we want to monitor the next, you know, starting next spring and next year is, can we have the lake we had this year with less treatment? Or can we have a better lake than this year with the same amount of treatment? I mean, I think that's part of a decision-making process with the board and the committee. I'd like to shoot for pretty aggressive because I'd like to see if we can get the water clarity up above five feet and do some of these other things, drop the phosphorus down faster. And my plan is to, I mean, there's a lot of pieces that got them in place, but my plan is to have a commercially viable product of this phosphorus sponge in the water next year, and you can pretty much guess where my first test lake is going to be. So, <laughs> uh, on that vein, concerning future costs, you said you recommended we continue aeration, which seems like an obvious thing to do. Are the aeration units leased, or what? Is, you know, what are the costs to operate the uh, the aeration unit? Uh, they're leased for seven years at a fixed rate. We cover all maintenance, we cover all break fix. When we added the three diffusers uh, and the airline to do that, there was not an additional bill. Um, so that's the, you know, that's the benefit of, we think, we think a managed system is the right way to go for at least uh, seven to 10 years. At the end of the seven years, um, you know, we have done buyouts it's not like a one dollar buyout but because even at the end of seven years with all the replacement we do and the maintenance we do you're basically getting a new system so there's a point where you can get off that train but in order for me to recoup the investment and maintain uh maintain control over the quality of what that system is doing that's why we do these these seven year contracts and also They've been doing all the maintenance, and I've watched these guys do the maintenance, and it's not something that I, my committee, or maintenance, <laughs> our maintenance department is going to be able to do. Scuba gear. So, yeah, I don't know about any scuba gear, but that's a benefit they, of leasing. They work pretty hard. It. They yeah. need a lot of cookies to keep going. <laughs> <laughs> I like it on that. Gotcha. Uh, who I first hear that. What impact are, is our um, waterfowl populations? Oh, you know, I, I, 
if you, I don't see, I, mean, I don't know how many geese are here when I'm not around. I didn't see enough geese where I was alarmed at it while, when I was here from, you know, April through this week. Uh, but I think if geese are a problem in the winter, that's something that can be a contributor of a pretty significant amount of nutrient. The, all of the, the birds of prey waterfowl, the, the herons, the hawks, the eagles, the osprey, those are your best friends because, quite frankly, if, if I should have said this earlier, the way we're currently taking phosphorus out of the lake and why it is a slow process, slower than what we want, is we're taking phosphorus out of the lake by growing fish. And the only way to get that phosphorus out of the lake is one, to do the floating island plantings and pull that stuff out of the lake at the end of the season. The other is every fish that's eaten by the herons, the eagles, the osprey, and any people that eat fish or fertilize their tomatoes with white perch are, are actually taking phosphorus out of the lake. A hundred pounds of fish equals one pound of phosphorus. One pound of phosphorus is enough to grow 10,000 pounds of wet weight of algae. So that's the map. So your white perch tournament, I understand you got catfish, a lot of catfish in the lake that are breeding now. Those fish are, are taking up phosphorus. Now, if you just let those fish die in the lake, that phosphorus returns into the lake. But if the birds and you are taking fish out, you know, put the trophies back, but take the white perch out, take the yellow perch out. If you don't want to eat them, you know, throw them to the herd. Throw them to the herd, you know, <laughs> bury them around your garden, you know, and get them out of the lake. This lake can support the harvesting of a lot of fish. And and I encourage that, particularly if you're selective in the in the species and the sizes that you take out. Two years ago we had more problems with waterfowl. Can we start a program with uh, telling people not to feed the waterfowl? And also a lot of people uh, got noisemakers and we we uh, do some harassment of waterfowl and we put little flashes out and things like that. So over the last couple of years we really haven't had that many waterfowl. And most of the ones that are at the lake are passing through. We don't have that many residents anymore. Resident waterfowl, and I think. Uh, so I don't, I don't see us having a problem right now. I mean, some waterfowl on the lake is, is a good thing. So, I, you know, I don't see a problem with that. Uh, and we don't have an overabundance of them uh, staying at the lake. So uh, we're, not, we're going to continue harassing them, continue, you know, not feeding them. I think yeah, that's it's, really, it's, it's really the goose. I would I would have We have a few small ones that come back last few years and yeah. come back and they stay for an extended period of time. Mm -hmm. I've heard that the goose don't like the swans. Yeah. Could that be a contributing factor to it? Because they don't yeah. um, stay for a while? I guess it could be. I mean, we don't have swans. So what are swans? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and they have, because they come back by the shop all the time yeah. and they're here for an extended here. period of time. Most of the time. Is the makeup of the biologics we're putting in a trade secret? You didn't mention Jenner. Uh, some of it is, yeah. yeah some of it. It's a lot of bacillus. It's a lot of bacillus. Bacillus is the is the most aggressive organic eater. And actually, what what the biology is doing, it's not eating phosphorus directly. That's another reason why I don't see the phosphorus drop. Bacteria is not very, uh, not a very good phosphorus eater. It's a great carbon eater. And it turns out that blue-green algae needs more than, more than just phosphorus, nitrogen, and sunlight. It also needs a lot of these organic carbon compounds. So the short-circuiting that we're doing is more about affecting the carbon cycle than it is the phosphorus cycle. Um, but yeah, there it's it's not something I advertise too much. Any other questions? Well, John, thank you very much. For the very <laughs> I got one last thing. Thank, thank you. This